Okay. Now the camera is uh, switched on and it's uh, a quarter past two. Uh, welcome to uh, our aesthetic seminar series. Um, my name is uh, Jakob Lund. And I'm happy to present today's speaker, uh, Christina Barbia, who was meant to give a lecture, I think, in November 2020, just after the uh, conviction of the Golden Dawn that we had to postpone twice, I think. Uh, but now we're here, and the material has expanded uh, since then, which is, which is good. Uh, Christina is... Um, a, uh, a research fellow between Aarhus University and uh, the Louisiana Museum of, of Modern Art, north of Copenhagen. Uh, and also, uh, she's a, a former deputy director of uh, forensic architecture in, uh, in, in London, where she's also based, a Greek citizen. Though, that's also why I've tried to sort of mess up uh, the room a bit, uh, to make uh, Christina feel more at home. Um, <laughs> Her PhD project uh, uh, focuses on uh, biopolitics and, and uh, imaging of, uh, of uh, the human body. Um, I'm sure you could say a lot more about that, just to, to, to give you a bit of context. Uh, and also, I should say that, that Christina was trained as an, as an architect and has uh, taught at the AA, the Architectural Association, uh, also in London. And she's currently also a uh, an, uh, <laughs> an associate lecturer at the Center for Research uh, Architecture at, uh, at Goldsmiths. And she's a founding member uh, and chair of the board of uh, Forensis, which is a, a recently established Berlin-based uh, association um, uh, founded by the uh, also by Forensic Architecture. At the moment, Christina is, amongst many other things, uh, Christina is uh, preparing uh, uh, an exhibition on forensic architecture at the, at the Louisiana, which will open on May 28th. And there will also be, uh, that the exhibition will also be accompanied by a, a, a book uh, publication, which we look much forward uh, to read and, and see. Um, I think the title of the exhibition is Witnesses. Uh, and that also sort of uh, is connected to what uh, Christina will talk about today, which is witness in in uh, in court. And uh, Christina's lecture will be about uh, an hour-ish, and there will be a small break before in between. In between yes, before the, the the conclusion or whatever you would call it, where there will be coffee outside, um, and after that we will. You're all invited for an informal uh, drink in the uh, in the lunch room in the building over there. But that's then. This is now. So I will uh, hand over to you, Christina. Great. Thank you. And thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's great to be here and to um, finally get to do this. As Jakob said, you know, this uh, the idea for this lecture really came about. Um, at this very particular moment in October 2020 when a verdict convicting Golden Dawn um, kind of came about from the Greek courts and um, I was uh, very lucky to be part of this uh, investigation in one of the cases there so we thought it would be nice to reflect. From then onwards there's, you know, that, that chapter somehow has closed but it continues in many other ways and so we decided to expand the lecture into another case as well which I will show you, but uh, I will ask for your uh, patience because there's a lot of material to go through and I've written some notes so that helps structure uh, where, how, how we go about this also because um, on the interest of time. But uh, perhaps we can start um, with this moment. <laughs> So as you can see, this 
wanted to share this kind of moment with you because it has this incredible energy um, and it is it is really testifying to the moment of um, Golden Dawn uh, is deemed as, as a criminal organization. It is announced to the demonstration, the mass demonstration outside of the court. And it is important because the trial of Golden Dawn was the most significant legal confrontation of the Nazi party since the Nuremberg trials. So, as I mentioned, I had uh, the pleasure of working one of the key cases. And, um, and in the meantime, from that moment until now, I also happen to have to present as an expert witness in court in, in another case that we investigated in Greece. So today I wanted to talk to you about those uh, two cases, two killings that happened in Athens and that forensic architecture has investigated and presented in court in one form or another. And in this occasion also reflect a little bit on FA's methods and practices. And just a note to everyone that um, this talk includes mentions of islands, although I will try to avoid showing graphic footage, the nature of, of these events and some of the descriptions could be quite disturbing for people, so please um, be advised and if you want to, to kind of leave the room, please go ahead and do so, there is no issue whatsoever. So starting with the murder of Pavlos Fisas on the 18th of September 2013. Pavlos Fisas, or Hilapi, which was his uh, artistic name, was an anti-fascist rapper and musician from Keratini, a working class neighborhood in, in uh, Athens, close to the port of Piraeus. And we were commissioned by his mother in 2017 to look into the events of his killing. The murder marked the culmination of Golden Dawn's criminal activity, which spanned decades of brutal attacks against migrants' political opponents um, and um, anyone really who came their way since their formation in the late 1980s. But from May 2012 until May 2019, Golden Dawn was also a political party that had representations in the Greek and European parliaments. This is Fissa's killer, Georgios Rupakias, who can be seen here posing in one of the Golden Dawn training trips. And uh, on the 28th of, of September 2013, so 10 days after the killing of Pavlos, the Greek police arrested the leadership of Golden Dawn as well as tens of, uh, of its party officials and members who were involved in different criminal activities. This is Nikos Michaloliakos, the leader of the party. And this was really the result of a huge case file that came after a long conquest of nine months and included 69 defendants. 18 of which were members of parliament. So all of Golden Dawn's kind of political leadership was part of that trial. These are some other of Golden Dawn's MPs. You can see um, them being arrested and protesting to it. And the trial began on the 20th of April 2015 in an improvised courtroom in the women, within the women's prison in, in Korydalos in Athens. The space was completely inapt for the trial of such a scale it lacked space for the lawyers of the 69 defendants, the press, and the significant audience. Uh, it could not provide any protection for the witnesses, meaning there were plenty of opportunities for intimidation, and they did really happen. It became a battlefield at some point. The acoustics and audiovisual equipment were completely outdated and insufficient. And after some deliberation with the lawyers, it was decided that the trial would be held in two different courtrooms interchangeably, this courtroom in Corridalos and the significantly more prestigious main courtroom um, in, in the Court of Appeal in Athens, which is this. Significantly, any time that video had to be played, it needed to be the small courtroom because of the mm -hmm. audiovisual uh, issue. Mm -hmm. The trial was set to investigate three crimes conducted by Golden Dawn, um, the different members of Golden Dawn, the murder of Pavlos Fisas, which was what instigated that whole process, the attempted murder of Abu Jibe Barak, who, uh, which was during an organized attack against three fishermen and the attempted murder of representatives of the Greek Communist Party. It was also established to determine whether Golden Dawn as a whole was a criminal organization. And so in Greece, if you are part of a criminal organization, whether you have done a crime or not, it's still a punishable offense to be, to have the intent to, to, to do uh, some criminal uh, act. So this, this particular Part of, of uh, the trial is significant because if Golden Dawn was deemed to be a criminal organization, they could no longer be allowed to stand for election to have representation in the parliament. 
Um, and so the trial itself, I mean, it's a really significant, there are many people who've written and, and uh, worked on this trial, and it has opened up multiple facets of Golden Dawn's criminal operations throughout the years. The evidence that was used to incriminate individuals was overwhelming, but the, the really difficult thing was trying to reveal the networked way that uh, Golden Dawn really operated, and the way they were entangled with different parts of, of Greek government, and as well as the police. So, for example, the, the trial touched rather lightly on the role of the police in, in um, enabling, either actively or through their incompetence, Golden Dawn's criminal activity. So the murder of Pavlos is really a prime example of inaction and enablement, silent enablement, uh, as according to witness testimonies, the, the VS, the special force um, uh, unit, was present at the time of the killing. However, the officers claimed that they arrived at the scene too late and that they were too few to be able to prevent the killing. These are their statements. So we were asked to examine the audiovisual documents included in the court files, which consisted of CCTV footage, audio recordings and transcriptions, and written testimonies. I should also mention, mention the research team for this work consisted mainly of Stefanos Levidis, Simon Rowett, and myself. The key, the key camera that captured the killing um, was the CCTV camera that was set up outside in a lingerie shop. The site of the killing is at the very far end of the frame, so almost at the vanishing point. And this will come kind of, you will see how, how it comes with its own challenges. Um, an audiovisual examination of the footage was necessary because almost none of the files including the case in, in, were encoded with accurate metadata. So each shop owner would program their cameras in their own way. They would just kind of put in a time or forget to put in a time. So they, we had the, the footage, but we didn't have accurate times. However, our report was not the only one that was doing an audiovisual investigation. Um, the audiovisual examination, sorry, the, the anti-terrorist division of the police also produced a, a preceding report, which contains an examination of all video footage and audio recordings. But the, the report that they submitted to court was not only insufficient, but at times really patently false. So, for example, there is one moment that we analyze in our report where uh, we have an instance with two ambulances that are observed traveling northwards. According to the police audiovisual assessment, these vehicles are recorded to be passing through the second camera uh, to the north before they are passing through the first. <coughs> so doing this sort of strange sort of loop. So this reveals not only the incompetency of the investigators, but also their unwillingness to thoroughly examine and cross-reference their own results. So it would be it's also important to note that it would be exceptionally simple for the investigators who went to collect this is difficult material to check the time of the camera. They, all they had to do is look at their own clock and note down the difference between the material that, that they got. But their failure to do so basically necessitated a year-long investigation from us in order to piece everything together and make sense of the scene. So. We synchronized all of the material by carefully examining the movement of pedestrians as well as vehicles and matching background sounds, which I'll show you in a bit, on various recordings in order to correctly time and synthesize all the available evidence into a single coherent timeline of events. So the, the final video that I showed you, the one that captured, partially captured uh, the killing, was synchronized by noticing a convoy of vehicles as it passes through um, the different subsequent um, the different uh, cameras that are laid up across the street. We then had to synchronize audio recordings, some of which had accurate metadata, and we did this by mapping the arrival of the ambulance that connected <laughs> So the idea was to find like a sort of Rosetta Stone that was, would be able to connect the sound with the silent image, right? But so we had to to work with files that had metadata and others that didn't, and we co we connected those um, by listening to the dialogue and understanding how one file fits between two, or by listening to the background sounds of the calls 
And in some recordings, there, for example, in the ambulance call center, you have operators sitting in the same room, so often we hear overlaps in this recording. So I'll give you an example here. Who's Sometimes we had to zoom into the granular level of the recording in order to find connections between the evidence. So this, this was something that was really faint and we had to observe. So finally we have this synchronized sequence which is connected again through the arrival of the ambulance and what it means because the arrival of the ambulance is also uh, perceived in the CCTV uh, footage. So what this means is that we have this sort of dashboard, a sort of control panel where, where we're able to both see through the windows that are available to us and at the same time listen at what is being discussed. So this is... Um... <laughs> So this is a sort of uh, hyper-witnessing, if you like, a, a, a perspective that none of the witnesses who were there in the scene would be able to perceive. It's something that is kind of um, technologically enabled and, and um, in a way it both uh, kind of comes from a distance but at the same time creates a, a newfound audiovisual proximity, if you like. So through that lens, um, let us now kind of see um, three, the events through this lens. So at, I'll start narrating as you see this in real time. So at 11.58 and 11 seconds, we see two units of the DS officers arrived at what would be the scene of the murder on four motorcycles. We mark the police with a blue collar, Colin Don with yellow and Pablo's friends with light green. Around three minutes later, the, of, the officers informed their operational control center that only one unit was present. Officers later claimed that they had on, only been called to the scene at 11.59, so they lied about the time of the call as well. <laughs> At 11.59 and 8 seconds, a convoy of vehicles is captured on camera approaching the scene from the direction of the local Golden Dawn headquarters. The first car in the convoy matches the description of the killer's car, Rupakias, which is a silver, a silver Nissan Almir. Phone diagrams of the, of the night reveal Golden Dawn's organizational logic where each member was in close communication with their superior, superior who then was informed and approved of the attack. This connected the people who were on the scene with MPs that are, were directly responsible for them. The statutory documents of Golden Dawn reveal a diagram of absolute vertical organization, this pyramid on top of which is the is the leader and the document that explains what is the rule of the absolute leader. So there is no decision that is made without uh, prior approval of uh, Michal Oliakos, who is the leader of the, of the party. At 11.59 and 40 seconds, the... Oh, sorry. Is this playing? Uh, at 11.59 and 40 seconds, the police motorcycles reappear on the same camera. Yes. Uh, 
um, apparently having driven around the block. And this is a journey that they have not reported to their control center, nor did they ever mention their subsequent testimony. So they kind of hid the fact that they did the lab. <laughs> This is the key moment. There we go. Okay, at uh, at 12:01 and 49 seconds. We see people fleeing from the scene. These are most likely friends of Fisas, who are fleeing uh, from members of Golden Dawn, uh, who arrived with a convoy and vehicles. We know this from later. Testimonies as well. And so between 12.02 and 10 seconds and 12.03, the silver Nissan Almira is seen again. So, Ό,τι άτομα βλέπουμε να τρέπεται στη φυγή, λαχανιασμένο, μας ενημερώνται. Το δεσπέρασμα μέχρι να ενημερωθούν. Βλέπετε ακόμα άτομα να κυνηγάνε. Sorry, I just wanted to narrate that at this point you see the car of the killer who is I leave this on sometimes because I think the the, the quality of the audio also is, is somehow telling. So according to the movement of the car and knowing the location of the crime scene, we know that the murder um, took place within a time frame, the time frame that is estimated between 12.03 and 26 seconds and 12.04 and 6 seconds. So during this period, uh, at 12.03 and 35 seconds, one of the officers sends a radio message that he and his colleague, co colleagues are present on the scene trying to break up the people. So I would now invite you to look closely at this pixelated footage and just to know that we've marked in blue what we think are the police officers based on their, their uniform which is black with white helmets. So at 12.05 and 20 seconds, the officers reported that Pavlos was injured. <laughs>
κέντρο, είμαστε στα Λάρη, Αγίου Ταλάρη Σταλίου, στη Μεταφόρτ, και ο Πατώνης και ο Αποκοσμός της Ευρωπαϊκής So within these few blurry pixels, a wider relationship between the Greek police force and Gordon Don is brought into question, suggesting a potential enablement of far right violence through police inaction and silent support. The, one of the, our key conclusions here is that the police is present at any given moment while this uh, is going on. And please note the comment that was just heard on whether the victim was Greek or a foreigner. The <laughs> So the, the relationship between the Greek police and the far right movements goes, goes back to the Greek uh, military junta in the late 1960s and early 70s and even the Greek civil war at the end of the, the 1940s. And it's important to note that the police officers who were present in the scene did not arrest Rupakias, the killer, who later claimed that, in fact, he, 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 confessed, he confessed to the murder. Another police unit had to come in and, and uh, do this. And when Rupakias was arrested and was asked about the bloody knife that was in the scene, he turned around to the police officer and said, yes, I was the one who did it, but don't say anything, I'm one of you. So the officer responded, what do you mean, are you police? And the killer replied, no, I'm, I'm Golden Dawn. And so, assuming in this way that police are also part of Golden Dawn, and indeed, it's not uh, such a stretch, because in, two, in the 2012 elections, reports mentioned that up to 50% of uniformed officers, so police, military, and other civil ser servants who are voting in particular centers, voted for Golden Dawn. So 50% kind of agreed with this uh, sort of ideology. So our investigation. So on the 19th of July 2019, our investigation is about to play it, um, to be screened in the courtroom um, in Athens. The defense lawyers of Golden Dawn object that this is not an original footage, but rather a montage, and so they ask that it is not shown. The court stops the screening to examine the objection, and they move on to to other things. And later, the court breaks for the summer period. On the 10th of September 2018, our investigation is finally screened in, in the Greek court after the objection is um, dismissed. These are photographs taken by one of the FA researchers from inside uh, the courtroom in Corita Laws, where you're not allowed to have photography, therefore the quality of the photographs is really concealed. Um, and so the screening conditions, again, to mention they're far from ideal, the lights were on, the sound was terrible and very low. But, um, but still, it, it was quite interesting uh, to see how this was received. And especially, I think what's nice about these images is the photographs, the way that they captured the, the police officers who are guarding the courtroom and their interest in, in seeing this. A few days later, on the 18th of September 2018, uh, it's the fifth year anniversary of uh, the murder of Pavlos. This is the, the, the protest that ensued. And so you see the anti-fascist movement is stronger than ever. And finally, we land in this moment on the 7th of October 2020, and uh, a few minutes after Golden Dawn, not actually, uh, sorry, a few seconds after Golden Dawn was, uh, was uh, convicted as a criminal organization, so from the clip that I showed you, less than 30 seconds, less than a minute, um, after this announcement, the police officers who were in the scene um, um, essentially start uh, throwing uh, water and, uh, and breaking up the people who have gathered there. Mm. So it's also important to, to kind of see the continuation of, of that violence and the fact that the police officers who were present in the scene of the killing of Pavlos never got, um, got investigated. The statute of limitations was anyway over, um, expired in 2018. But you see also with this incident the way that, that the mass demonstration is is dealt with that police violence persists. So, take a sip and we go to the next case. <laughs> How's everyone feeling? Okay. I'll run through it. About 10 days after our investigation was presented in the court, 
the investigation of Paulus was presented in court, um, another brutal killing happened in the streets of Athens. Zakostopoulos, uh, or Zakio, who was a prominent LGBTQ activist, a drag show performer, and an actor, and he was brutally beaten to death on the 21st of September 2018 in broad daylight on a busy street in central Athens. It was not clear what happened that caused the beating. Uh, the first news of the day was that he attempted to rob a jewelry shop, although that was soon proven to be untrue because he didn't take anything, it was uh, blatantly untrue. And here we were contacted by Zach's uh, brother, Nikos Quimeldas, um, asking for our help only a few days after the killing of his brother. The footage of the event, uh, both that the footage that emerged both um, explained and complicated the narrative. Zach here is seen attempting to go into a, a bakery. He's stopped by two, three people. One of them enters the bakery, buys a bottle of water and offers it to Zach. The next available video, which is no more than 30 seconds later, shows Zach locked inside a jewelry shop. I'm not going to be showing this in moving image because they're very uh, brutal. But um, I will describe it to you. I hope you trust me. He is alone and he's trying to get out. He, so he's in this jewelry shop, he's alone trying to get out. Two people who we later found out were the shop owner and the realtor are seen outside of the shop. One of them throws an object inside and hits Zach in his head. As Zach tries to escape, they both beat him, brutally kicking him through the glass vitrine. Zach then lays on the ground outside the shop bleeding. Another video shows a medic arriving, then a police officer. The medic tries to treat with, uh, Zach's wounds. Zach is barely conscious, but in a peculiar moment, he, he gets up, grabs, grabs a piece of broken glass, and tries to run away. The police officers who are around the scene uh, kick him and follow him, uh, trying to put handcuffs on him. He's put on a stretcher and then taken to the hospital, where he arrives already dead, but still in his tie-wrap uh, handcuffs, which is also an offense to keep someone in handcuffs while he's dead. Uh, no one arrests the jewelry shop owner or the realtor. They are left to clean up the broken glass from the scene. And although this is not an attack by Golden Dawn, as the organization was at this point in its demise, it had very little activity after the, after the, the trial began. But what we note is that the fascist tendencies are now dispersed within uh, Greek society. And so they, and they also seem to persist within the Greek police. So when asked about the incident, the president of the Greek police officer said, well, this is the practice of the police. But it's your problem if you don't like it, right? So on December, on the 21st of December 2021, just a few months ago at 9 a.m., I arrived at the courts in Athens, in Greece. I handed in my ID and informed the police that I am in the witness list for the case of Zakos Kostopoulos. I was led into the waiting room. I spoke to Zach, Zach's brother who gave me, um, and, and his friends who, who came to support the trial. And the lawyer representing the family greeted me and explained that they will begin the trial shortly. After a few hours of waiting, I was called into the, break, uh, into the courtroom. I was asked to take a stand. I introduced myself in forensic architecture. I represented a small team of researchers, Jan Weizmann, Nikola Zembashi, and Stefan Zubivis, and others, who had investigated this footage. And, um, and I explained that forensic, forensic architecture's investigation have, have appeared in, uh, as evidence in court before. However, this was the first time that we really stood as expert witnesses uh, and in, in cross-examination. So I, begin, I began to kind of uh, explain and present our uh, tripart investigation. The first part of the investigation uh, was a study on the video material that captured the scene. We collected the videos that were found online and broadcasted in Greek TV channels and compared them to the video material that was included in the court documents. The court files included six videos, whereas an open sor source research revealed nine clips that were publicly available. Most importantly, the key video that captured the moment of the beating is only partially included um, in the court files. So YouTube, as well as other mainstream TV channels, were seen to be broadcasting um, more material from that source, either a longer version 
uh, of the same clip edited or multiple clips that were from the same videographer. So you can see the comparison of these two different diagrams here. The court was just was therefore in a very odd position where it had less material than what was available in the public domain. The fact that the investigator's office and the police officers who are assisting the investigator did not bother to gather the material, the, the videos, even though they were so easily available, is symptomatic of what we again call structural or intentional incompetence that forms a, a, a cover for, for essentially like dodgy police work. So in our, in our investigation, we found 12 additional cameras held by passerbys that had the ability of filming or photographing. About three or four of those cameras are visibly seen recording the crime scene. Um, and these were, of course, never requested by the authorities, even though we submitted a report about them. But we enjoy spotting them nonetheless. The second part of the investigation revolved around the key eyewitness a man with a yellow t-shirt that was there from the very beginning of the incident in the earliest available video. He was one of those who seen speaking to Zach and stopping him from entering into the bakery. He's seen throughout the assault. He is never participating in the assault himself, but he always remains in proximity and speaks on the phone, explains to the medic where Zach has been hurt. Um, and at the moment of the arrest, the man is also standing very close to Zach and to the police and it even, it's, he's even seen holding a policing button which you can see here on the right. Um, so his face is very clearly visible. Um, however, even after a prompt from, the Zach's, uh, from Zach's family and their legal team to find this person, the investigator claimed that it was impossible to find. He was just, we just don't know where, who he is and, and how could we ever find him. So we wondered, is he an undercover police? Uh, why is he allowed, allowed to stand so close to, to the scene and even hold uh, a weapon? I mean, we still don't know about this, but in order to assist with finding it, uh, to finding him, this man with the yellow t-shirt, we made a short video investigation, locating each camera um, and highlighting all the moments that he appears in the scene, demonstrating in this way that Basically, he's a key witness and, and um, more is needed in order to, to, for him to be found. And I'm just showing you part of the, the short investigation. It's one of the cases where we did not do a full, uh, we didn't have the time basically because we needed to submit in the, in the, in the pre-trial part. So we didn't have the time to do a full investigation of the incident. We just uh, focused our energy on this one man with, with the yellow t-shirt. But we still had to locate everything. So in yellow, you see all the moments where this man appears through the footage. Mm -hmm. um, we published the short video um, widely, both online and in newspapers through our media partners and through a small exhibition in Athens. And a few hours after the, the launch of the investigation, we received a couple of messages with clues to this person's identity. By the end of the day, we knew the witness's name and we had his Facebook profile. Two, late, two days later, he went to the official investigator and testified. So once again, here are the authorities' unwillingness to, to locate this witness purposefully kind of leaves gaps in the understanding of the, of the incident. And although his written testimony um, was not really incredibly, it did not offer much detail in understanding the event, we still maintain that the, he is a key witness and and um, it is very important to, to examine him also in court, but the witness again fails to appear in court, so he's once more deemed untraceable. We have to do a second investigation. Mm -hmm. For the last part of my testimony, um, I rely on my notes offering the court a series of uh, timings for key events observed in the footage. I was able to do this because we had submitted this uh, synchronization of all available footage, which we had done for our own kind of working process. And so I began by explaining the method for synchronization, similar to the uh, FISA's case. Um, we connected one camera to, to another by noticing the movement of pedestrians and vehicles. Um, but as I'm explaining this, the judge seems completely uninterested. She says like, okay, where is this all leading? So she's quite impatient. I'm, I was insisting that uh, these details are very important. 
I ask whether it is possible to watch the synchronized footage at the same time as I'm explaining those, those timings, but the prosecutor says no. We will watch this on the days where we go through the documentation. So this decision is, is quite major because from that moment onwards, um, I start narrating the events um, in that as they are shown in the videos, but without being able to, to show them. I am separated from the footage because I am a witness and the synchronized footage is evidence and we belong to very different juridical processes. So I'm thus forced to kind of talk about images without using images. The conversation obviously after that was fundamentally abstract um, and but I started kind of um, dictating a series of timings and the lawyers of both sides started kind of noting them down studiously. So we'll give you some of the timings here to, to show you how they understood it as well. So at 2.47, 42 seconds, we see the jewelry shop for the first time and Zach is already locked inside. 2.48 and 3 seconds, reflections on the pavement indicate vitrine glass already appears broken. 2.48 and 11 seconds, the shop owner throws an object inside the shop. The object hits Zach on the head. The vitrine seems to be already broken from the outside as the object draws an, un an uninterrupted trajectory. Glass appear uh, already appears on the pavement. 2.48 and 26 seconds, Zach opens a sliding door at the bottom part of the vitrine attempting to get out. 2.48 and 30 seconds, the realtor kicks Zach for the first time, hitting his head and further breaking the vitrine. 2.48 and 30 seconds until 2.48 and 41 seconds. For 11 seconds, both men are kicking Zach. Zach receives 14 strikes, not all of them reach him, but most of them are hitting his head. Nine of the kicks are from the realtor and five from the shop owner. At 4.50 and 59 seconds, the first police officer arrives. Four, sorry, not four, two. 2.50 and 59 seconds. 2.50 and 56 seconds, the man with the yellow t-shirt informs the police that he needs an ambulance and that he is not hit at the neck but at the hands and at the head. 2.51 and 12 seconds, the medic is leaning over, and this is plus or minus 45 seconds, it's a big margin there. The, the medic leans over um, Zach and is treating his wounds. 2.42 and 55 seconds, Zach grabs a piece of glass, gets up and tries to escape. 2.53 and 8 seconds, a police officer kicks Zach on the waist. Zach stumbles and falls on some tables. 2.53 and 22 seconds, a police officer hits Zach with a baton. 2.53 and 25 seconds, the police officers fall on him, trying to grab a piece of glass. 2.53 and 56 seconds, plus and minus 30 seconds, the police officers release the glass from Zach's hands. 2.54 and 26 seconds, a police officer kicks Zach while he's on the ground. This is 18 seconds after the glass is released and another officer yells, pull his legs. 2.54 and 37 seconds. The officers lift his legs and drag Zach on the pavement. His head is ground against the floor. 2.54 and uh, 50 seconds, Zach's left hand appears lifeless. 2.55 and one second, we can see and hear the tie wrap handcuffs locking. And approximately at 2.57 and 30 seconds, plus or minus a minute and a half, because we don't have accurate footage, we see Zach on a stretcher being moved into the ambulance. And then begins the cross-examination as I conclude my statements. Um, the lawyers of the family begin and ask me some clarifying questions, mainly aimed to highlight that the glass vitrine was broken from the outside and therefore Zach wasn't, wouldn't have been responsible for breaking it. And then the defense uh, start their uh, cross-examination. I am asked whether I see Zach holding a knife and I respond that such an object is not clearly visible from the footage that we have available. Later on, in a moment of excitement, there is allegedly a knife that Zach was holding that, that uh, is mentioned from other witnesses. Uh, later on, in a moment of excitement, well, one of the lawyers um, of the defense suggests, sorry, one of the lawyers of the family suggests that I was a well-standing witness, offering objective findings, 
a lawyer from the defense protests. We saw how objective this witness is. She sees clearly a lifeless hand and she cannot observe a knife of a certain size. So separated from the footage, this argument could have a very good standing. How can one see one detail and not the other? Yet as an argument, it completely failed to take into account the positionality of my knowledge. As I was not present at the scene of the crime, my knowledge is, of the event is wholly dependent on the open source video recordings that were available at the time of the investigation. The scene where Zach is allegedly holding a knife is recorded by a shaky phone camera from the first floor of the opposite side of the road. What can be seen on the footage is a series of reflections that could be attributed to holding a knife, as you can see there, or it could be attributed to, to some shiny part of the fire extinguisher that he was holding, or the glass door that separated Zach from the street. The video is simply not clear enough for us to be able to determine what those reflections are. So regardless, the lawyer's comment assumes that as an expert, I should have an overall God's eye view of the event where each scene is described in the same level of clarity. The reason why I could see a hand that was lifeless um, indicating that Zach was at the time unconscious is because there exists a video that frames a close-up view of the arrest and this is recorded in high resolution and a steady hand. So the cross-examination continues with questions of how many people were present during the whole incident. I responded as a very abstract question because at any given moment the number of people changes, it's not the same, and we don't have full visibility uh, of the street through the available cameras. But this, state this statement is also met, met with a scold. And there are further questions about the clarification of some timings, but most importantly the focus a certain focus on my use of the word lifeless, which they didn't like at all, especially the lawyers of the police didn't want to, to um, be seen to be the ones um, that caused uh, the death, although essentially he died in their hands. There is another small debate about whether or not we should be showing the synchronized videos in order to assist the cross-examination. The defense is reluctant. At some point, one of the lawyers representing the police officers asks me, what does it mean that you have synchronized the videos? You have cut and stitched videos together? So insinuating that the act of composition is itself suspicious. And again, um, here I, I respond that it's a simple compilation uh, where the videos are placed, placed next to each other for their concurrent viewing in real time. I mean, this is not even the sort of investigation we usually do where we really use three-dimensional models in order to to uh, place videos um, in the scene, it was simply just kind of placing them next to each other. And maybe we'll take a break here, yes. so we can reflect on it after. Mm -hmm. I know some heavy stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming back after this. <laughs> um, so the, the last part is a little bit more um, informal in the sense that um, it's just um, some of the reflections. But it started from picking it up from where we left it off after the, the cross-examination, after my presentation in the court on the 18th of January 2022, which was the next court session. The lawyers um, discussed the witness testimonies offered in the previous session, and I was not present there, but my testimony was commented upon. And one of the lawyers of the defense brought out a copy of uh, E.L. Weizmann's book, who is also the director of French character for us, I'm sure you know by now. But, um, so a copy of Yad Weizmann's book, uh, Forensic Architecture, Violence at the Threshold of Detectability, which, which was recently translated into Greek. So attempting to counter the claim that I was an objective witness, um, the lawyer brings forth um, this section of the book, which is titled Engaged Objectivity. The Greek translation, however, 
frames it as militant objectivity. So engaged or militant objectivity, according to Eyal, is one, of, one that recognizes networks of solidarity and in fact highlights the, that investigations often take place because there's a certain affective uh, connection to the victims of violent crime. So mis mis misconstruing the, the meaning of the segment, the lawyer uh, was content that he has proven that forensic, the forensic architecture team, and myself included, are in fact biased. Yet, Eyal's text says something quite different. So although our efforts are engaged and militant, we still employ objectivity and the commitment to facts, as this is what will best serve the communities affected by violence. What we refuse to do, however, is um, adhere to a simplistic form of objectivity that is equated with neutrality and that considers the knowledge subject as immaterial. What we refuse to, to accept, in a way, is this all-knowing God's eye perspective. So, uh, as you can imagine, engaged objectivity builds on a strong tra tradition of feminist critique, standpoint of epistemologies and practices that demand a situated gaze. And so specifically for this last kind of few minutes of the talk, um, I will try to draw up on some of those theories in order to examine the position of expert, the expert witness and the role of civil society, not only as a potential uh, investigator, but primarily as a secondary witness. This is not a very well arranged page from now onwards, I will have to say, <laughs> I'm just running out of time. But what I was trying to do um, with uh, part of um, uh, some writing that's, uh, that is aimed to be in this catalogue in, in for the exhibition of, uh, in Louisiana Museum, uh, which was kind of uh, looking at, some, uh, at the idea of, of uh, expert witnessing, is go through some of those theories, mainly working with, um, with uh, Donna Haraway's uh, concept of the modest witness, of the modest witness, and uh, Sandra Hardy concept of uh, weak objectivity and later on strong objectivity and so um, essentially uh, Harding begins by uh, discussing the way or, or recognizing the way that institutions of science depend on a universal subject that is very often um, Eurocentric, anthropocentric. Um, it, it, they demand. They, they kind of begin by considering who is the, the subject able to create new knowledge in the, the science context. So by recognizing the provenance of that knowledge, that that usually comes from this kind of um, white, able-bodied kind of um, um, male subject. It's um, it's somehow. And, and by allowing this subject to defend this idea of neutrality, it fails to take into consideration the, the institution's own subjectivity, right? So Harding talks about this as weak objectivity because it is too weak to do what it sets out to do. And, uh, and in parallel in conversation with Harding, uh, Donna Haraway um, talks about this as the modest witness. And, um, and Haraway also depends very much on and analyzes the work of Simon Schaffler and, and Stephen Chapin, who uh, are doing kind of a work on on um, on the oil's air pump, so tracing a little bit the beginnings of uh, scientific experiments, and particularly uh, Schaffler uh, writes about this in another piece called Self Evidence, which really traces the beginnings of um, of um, the first kind of experimenters. Uh, of the 18th century who were really using their own body as a way to conduct their experiments, therefore auto-experimenters, right? So Chopin, uh, sorry, uh, Schaffler traces the role of the body that was originally very central in any scientific experiment. They were doing you know, experiments with electricity, with magnetism on their own selves and proving uh, the results and also traces the shift away from that where the body was slowly recognized to be not trustworthy enough to um, to create kind of universal results, and so there's a shift towards embedding skill within scientific instruments that are uh, that are considered to lack the will and the imagination to be biased, um, and so it's also the move towards automation. But um, 
but Schaffner talks about this as a, as a certain kind of Cartesian of the, of the gentium. So in polite society, he says, members could be treated as capable of separating their disorderly bodies from the cool deliverances of their intellectual judgment. So this sort of way of separating body and mind, which later leads on into kind of the fully, uh, kind of the scientific genius as this fully disembodied um, kind of figure, right? And Haraway builds upon that with, with her idea of a modest witness. So she, she takes this no, nobleness and, and talks about it as modesty and also as modesty is something that is only available to usually male subjects. So um, very often when women or other people wanted to enter into the institution of science, of, of science they're, they're, it, it was very much kind of um, noted upon that their body stood in the way, that they would be biased because they were uh, women. So, so modesty is something that's only available to a particular um, type of person, right? So, and Haraway describes this very nicely in this, in this uh, little segment. So this is the virtue that guarantees that the modest witness is the legitimate, authorized ventriloquist of the object, object world, adding nothing from his mere opinions, from his biasing embodiment. And so he is endowed with a remarkable power to establish the facts. He bears witness, he is objective, he guarantees the clarity and purity of objects. His subjectivity is his objectivity. His narratives have a magical power. They lose all trace of their history as stories, as products of partisan projects, as contestable representations, or as constructed documents in their potent capacity to define the facts. So she kind of summarizes this really nicely, I think. And again, um, Harding also talks about the way that social, like science, because people are doing it, so includes the sociality. So the necessity to recognize that sociality. Again, um, looking through uh, Lauren Dustin's and, and Peter Gallison's kind of epic work on objectivity. Uh, they also trace the idea of objectivity to be objective is to aspire to a knowledge that um, that bears no trace of the knower, right? And so, to counter that, again, Harding comes up with this idea of strong objectivity as um, as the necessity to to um, claim one's positionality, and um, and Haraway as well with with uh, her concept of situated <coughs> knowledges. Um, again, in, in Haraway's uh, words, a strong objectivity insists that both the object and the subjects of knowledge making practices must be located. So, simply put, they're asking the, the question, where do we know from? Where, what bodies do we know from, right? So, I'm taking this genealogy a little bit in order to trace also my role and my position um, as an expert witness at that moment. So here I'll try to kind of do that. What does it mean to situate the knowledge of an expert witness? So in the context of my testimony in the courtroom for the case of Zach, locating our work meant resisting to adhere to the profile of a universal subject that has an all-seeing uh, perspective. Firstly, I had to insist that my positionality and that of my uh, team, of the FA team, working on this investigation was conditioning our knowledge of the case. We conducted an investigation that was based solely on video footage derived from technological apparatuses, uh, cameras, mobile phones, CCTVs, and at the time of the investigation we did not have any access to other corroborating information like witness testimony. So strong objectivity in this case would be the insistence that our gaze is situated in a post-event reconstruction uh, based on the videographic representation of the event. And so so the fact that our knowledge is wholly dependent on what is visible through those cameras means that we are mediated secondary witnesses, right? So again, insisting on the, on the importance of the problems of, of that knowledge and the fact that we cannot determine some facts is quite key in asserting our situatedness as well as our expertise. And I don't personally think that this makes us weaker experts. I think on the contrary, it acknowledges that we have considered that uh, what cannot be discerned based on the available evidence and again brings further force in asserting that there are some parts of the story that in fact can be knowable and it is within those limitations that we should be trusted. Secondly, committing to a practice of uh, situating knowledge in this investigation meant 
the very careful geolocation and chronolocation of every piece of footage. It meant anchoring uh, the evidence in time and in space, and not only to reveal this kind of overarching narrative of what happened, but also to show the multiple gaps in knowledge uh, that derive basically from this patchy representation of the event. And it was here that my insistence of explaining the margins of error became most crucial because for me at least the margins of error are scientific tools that are helpful in defining the outlines of knowledge. They are something that could translate uh, Haraway's theory of the privilege of partial perspective into a very uh, heuristic uh, presentation tool. And so it's interesting in that respect that, that um, the judge was uh, had little patience for hearing about margins of error. It seems that that uh, the court was somehow more comfortable with solid statements rather than kind of nuanced understandings of um, or reflections on truth practices. So finally, the third part is um, kind of thinking about situating my knowledge. Um, it meant uh, for me something else, recognizing that you know beyond um, beyond the part that part of my expertise comes from my studies in architecture this is something that the judge was interested to know like what did you study why are you able to tell us those things that i am greek and english speaking i'm white skinned so i'm a well educated woman in, in her 30s and that my fellow co-investigators had somewhat kind of similar journeys and backgrounds i think situating um, Knowledge in this case also means recognizing the way that my body and the body of the bodies of my colleagues played a role in understanding the event that we were investigating. And so this might be might seem a little bit abstract, but it has quite concrete consequences, especially when you're thinking about an incident that has a, a traumatic that is traumatic by its nature, right? So here I'm, I'm kind of working through some other um, concepts and, and, and uh, theoretical work. So Yuval Noah uh, Harari introduces the term flat thicknesses that is useful, I think, in this moment uh, in order to describe, he uses it to describe the soldiers who have actively fought in the front lines of war. And so in his article, he draws a comparison between the authority of war accounts from scholars, eyewitnesses, and uh, what he terms flash witnesses who have this kind of fully embodied experience of, of war. And so for him, scholars have an overall understanding of historic events that is compiled from primary and secondary sources, and so they are capable of this kind of um, general survey that can, see, um, that can see events from afar. Eyewitnesses have this uh, privilege of proximity, but they're often too restricted in their understanding of events based because they're limited by their own kind of uh, position within the field, like they couldn't see, they couldn't hear everything, etc, etc. And further along that spectrum, uh, flesh witnesses are fully embedded um, and saturated by this experience. He, he uh, frames, Harari frames this as a different type of authority almost, so this unique privilege of um, of uh, being so embedded that that they are able to attest to the true nature of war, which is one beyond cognition and language, but that lies within sensation. So alluding to this kind of knowledge of the flesh, right? So <coughs> the body of the flesh witness um, operates as a mediatic surface, one that absorbs the traces of historic events of violence. Um, and uh, however, the, the field realities often overwhelm the bodies of flesh witnesses to the point where they're unable to give an account of what took place, what Yal Weizmann and Matthew Fuller call hyperesthesia, so this saturation of the senses. So the body in this case stands in the way of cognition. The body is the first mediatic object between the act of witnessing and the event. And you could say that the further kind of um, um, kind of the, a, a further step in mediatization um, is the act of testimony, but we can come to this later. So, I mean, this is very much uh, explored in Holocaust scholars like Primo Levi, who addressed very much as um, also talking about considering anyone who has survived as a witness, as to consider them as a witness by proxy, because uh, in, in Primo Levi's understanding and, and others, the real witnesses um, 
and the true witnesses are those who did not make it or that they have turned mute by their overwhelming exposure to violence. But Harari says this tension between those distinct quad categories of knowledge subjects, I, as, as, they, as they are like qualitatively also quite uh, different. But what I would like to argue today is to consider that even secondary witnesses, bystanders, journalists and scholars, as well as researchers, could also be considered partly flesh witnesses. And that any witness is a witness by proxy, always at least one step removed from the complexity of a multifaceted event, limited by their own bodily positions and the way their bodies receive information through their sensorium. So, I mean, of course we have to be careful, this is not to equate the experience of a bystander with that of a, of a victim. Um, of course I recognize that being in combat or fleeing war or experiencing the risk of death certainly makes a very different knowledge subject than a scholar who's kind of um, uh, approaching this from um, the safety of a library or a newsroom. But um, it's just to highlight that psychology has taught us that secondary trauma also has very real bodily effects, right? So when studying events of violence from a distance, um, researchers very often end up burnt, burnt out or even with post-traumatic stress disorder. And so accessing violence through media definitely cushions that experience, but it doesn't wholly conceal the subject from trauma. Um, and again, like not, not to make any, um, any suggestion that there is, there is a, a way that we could compare them, it's just to think about the ways that, that uh, us as secondary witnesses are also implicated in some way. And I have to say that, you know, even, um, even I felt the burden of this traumatic imagery when I, was, um, when I was working on this case, and I would be lying to you if, uh, if uh, I would say that it did not affect me, especially when you're looking at, you know, the scenes frame by frame and late at night, you know, the, very often those things sip through. So my proposition is to, instead of referring to these categories as uh, binary conditions, uh, arguing for or against the absolute superiority of one perspective over the other, should we not consider distance and proximity as intensifiers of experience and determining factors of epistemic positionality? Multiple scholars have kind of uh, highlighted the way that affected communities hold a certain type of embodied and embedded uh, expertise, but should we not consider also the act of witnessing as a gradation of mediation between event and experience, and perhaps the act of testimony as a further gradation mediation between the act of, um, between the event and, and uh, its arbitration, which is again dependent on language and memory, etc. So, um, in the courtroom, witnesses um, and evidence, such as photographs and videos, occupy very distinct categories. However, there is a parallel between the act of witnessing and that of the photographic evidence, best summarized through the word contact. To witness something, one must come in contact with that thing, and whether it is through visual contact, either through the eyesight in eyewitnesses or, or auditory contract, a contact through hearing and ear witnesses, or whether it is through close study in expert witnessing, uh, the moment of contact alters the witness. It inscribes within the witness embodied knowledge of a certain event. And so to bear witness uh, is therefore to, to process, um, is, is the, sorry, it's therefore the process of being affected by an event that imprint, imprints upon us um, on contact. This trace acts upon the material body, which in turn operates as media with its own mechanical and biological rules. So it's a very different type of media, but we could also consider it as media. Um, and here again, I'm also, I, I did not mention this before, but I'm also kind of working off uh, Susan Shupley's um, concept of material witness, which is that they, the way that she describes matter's ability to speak or often scribes evidentiary information and all of the processes that are used to decode that language uh, of uh, material. So in that respect, should my expert witness testimony be treated any different to the photographic evidence that has been created through the aperture of a camera? Am I also not a material witness as well as a vocal one? Again, this is not to equate uh, different complexities of material inscription, but rather it is to say that 
that um, the entanglement between testimony and evidence goes both ways. So, um, Eyal, uh, Eyal Weizmann argues that evidence often already includes testimony at its core, especially when we have video recordings um, of people fleeing a certain uh, scene and narrating the events as they go along. So the evidence itself is, it has some kind of testimony um, as part of it. But I would argue that testimony already uh, as well, testimony necessarily includes the evidence of a contact of an event with the body of a witness. So the principle of objectivity that relies on this disembodiment of the expert seeks to kind of erase this bodily material effect of that contact. And uh, I think of a feminist position would argue that it is this particular nature of the contact that gives an expert account its legitimacy. So in that sense, um, in the context of the courtroom, the feminist turn of objectivity could be considered as another call of habeas corpus. So a 21st century iteration of habeas corpus would not only demand the presentation of the body of the defendant uh, in order to assure that there is no unlawful imprisonment, but also demand the presentation of the body of the witness, its positionality and its capacity to inscribe media in order to qualify the location of knowledge. So write your body, as uh, Trin Minha says, show us the body which is speaking, do not hide behind the cloak of the universal subject, show us your limitations and show us how you are affected. And finally, um, perhaps this is also the, the proposition I would like to leave you in, what if we were to consider the free choice of engaging in secondary witnessing as an embodied political uh, practice, as, a, as an act of solidarity and of epistemological care, as an invitation to let ourselves be altered and to carry some of the burden of violence on behalf of those who are no longer able to speak. This does not come without its own eth ethical implications, I am aware. How could we protect each other from secondary trauma? How could I invite you, for example, uh, today and implicate you today to witness with me these acts of violence without spreading their harmful effects? So it's, it's kind of an open question, how could we consider secondary witnessing as a practice, as, as a practice that we're all kind of somehow involved in? And in a sense, both of the cases that I presented today have the question of witnessing in, in their core because Considering the public nature of uh, the lynching of Zach's case, the large number of people who were who happened to be passing by and saw some fragments of the event and the way that the event was recorded and uh, subsequently televised, and also regarding the significance of Pablo Fisa's case and um, uh, and the way it kind of gained kind of prominence, a big portion of the Greek society at least um, has been secondary witness or witness by proxy to these killings. So the reaction of the public, I think, cuts at the heart of, of Greek politics um, and perhaps politics, perhaps European politics as well. Um, some are appalled and some justify this violent death as necessary. And I think this is really, this is really what secondary witnessing does, right? It forces us to, to have a position. So perhaps I, I leave you with this. Does this violence fit comfortably with us? Or are we bruised by, by this contact? How do we how could we think about this? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christina. Um, you always uh, make uh, one feel sort of or one's work feel rather insignificant compared to what you do in, in uh, forensic architecture. Uh, so thanks for that. <laughs> um, questions or comments? Peter? Thank you, Christina. Sorry, it's um, just forming in my head, but thanks very much for this presentation, which just for me comes a few days after I saw in Berlin a very touching performance of a Chilean company about the 2019 uprisings and how it was yeah, brutally oppressed and um, all of them were in some way involved, have still bullets in their bodies and uh, teeth 
lost and present that in a very abstract, very different way, but I think there are some striking similarities there in the role of what you just said about the secondary witnessing presenting this um, to an audience. And, and what I'm interested in very much uh, to perhaps hear a bit more is this, well, you talk now about also your own position as a witness, your body as a witness, your body as, or your, your speaking position, how this was challenged and so on. But what is with that next line of aesthetic communication, the communication um, that happens also beyond the courtroom? I think you, forensic architecture, don't only speak to the judge, but to someone else, and here it becomes very interesting with this investigative aesthetics, what, what you're also doing aesthetically with organizing information in ways that then are communicated on, and I'm not sure where I'm going really with, with this um, question of this act of secondary witnessing. The other thought I had is the, the, the imbalance that was very much made clear in the Chilean performance of the addressee, so the secondary witness they address as a northern, global north spectator who doesn't give a fuck about Chile, and they made that very clear. So um, how do you then also communicate as witness to people who normally don't you shit what happens in Greece because this is this sort of southern Europe and you know that this sort of balance of witnessing that I find a very interesting way that you then also often see perhaps in discussions of people going to an exhibition of forensic architecture seeing it as art and mm. bringing in this distance and trying to perhaps avoid being politically affected, seeing it in maybe an old aesthetic deta detachment, asking where's the art and that and all those questions. I don't know, so just throwing some yeah, things yeah, yeah. <laughs> into no, about I mean, these lines of conversation. Of course, and I think so. that, mm. I mean, definitely, it's not, you know, we do present our investigations in court, but it's a very small section of what we do. Most of our the investigations we work on are never presented in court. This is almost exceptional, right? Um, and so, I mean, after, out of the 70 investigations, maybe five or six or seven have been presented, right, So, uh, in court. So um, I definitely uh, see that this is not the only uh, sort of um, way that one could, could approach this. And in fact, I, I do think that for me, it's more interesting to think of secondary witnessing as every other form but the court, right? Because I mean, the court is problematic, and it has its own, its own kind of inner structures and protocols that are completely kind of, uh, at least the Greek court, completely like media uh, kind of um, um, opposite of progressive, regressive or something like. Like they're very challenged, media challenged, right? Um, but you know, the the fact that the the investigation of of the Fisa killing had most of its effect was the fact that it was published online for free and, and, and an enormous amount of people sat down and watched the 14 minute investigation because it, it mattered so much to understand what happened in this incident. Granted, this was mainly a, a local uh, kind of uh, audience, right? It was mainly Greeks who were interested to watch this and it did have a very local effect in that way uh, and it created a um, and if, but I think the politics of, of viewing this and being able to, to witness it, because we, had, we heard so many accounts, it was very difficult to understand really what was going on. And so to be able to witness the evidence in real time almost, because we played the thing and we let them watch it in real time, um, meant that it, it opens up the space of who gets to have an opinion. Not only the court gets to be able to understand what this evidence uh, is, right? Like not only in a closed room, but but you distribute it widely, which means that anyone who watches it understands more about the case and the particularities of this case. Now, in terms of um, in 
terms of how do you convince people who are not, uh, who do not care, or who, who, you know, it doesn't affect them because this is Greece and, you know, here's Denmark, for example, usually we would just do an investigation about the place that they do care because the, those things are connected, you know, like, it, neo Nazis don't only exist in Greece, it's just um, one of the, the, the formations that, that they have taken and they affect one another. We were very surprised to see when you know the the Charlottesville attack happens, uh, what was it? When when Trump came up and said, "Oh, there's two sides in each, there's two sides in this, right?" Like the the neo-Nazi attack in Charlottesville, and there was a documentary from Vice that was filming the the right uh, um, kind of the right-wing protesters before they went on to protest. Like they they knew that they were organizing an online forums and they were gathering together, and part of the question of the interview and from the from the vice interviewer was like what you know what are you inspired by and they said oh by by Greece's golden dawn right so the way that that those movements come in and come in and out of history are not only within those particular contexts so it's important to somehow kind of make those connections and um, and understand that also the, the way that they organize themselves through media, through different kind of online forums, is a way that, that it affects them. Now, in terms of, um, I mean, there's a lot to say, but in terms of exhibitions, again, there's some exhibitions that are used very tactically for us in order to create a certain, um, a, a very particular um, political discussion. So this is usually, you know, in the case of Zach here, we presented this little investigation about about the importance of the, the witness in the yellow t-shirt and the same day he was found. It was presented mainly in an exhibition. We used the, the kind of the press uh, interest of the exhibition to kind of uh, put it in prominence. So sometimes they're used tactically and sometimes they're used as a, as a space of reflection and as a way to, to think about our own practices and our own you know, visual tools to check up on ourselves and to let more people in into our processes to make sure that you know that we are not missing something or that we are going in the right direction in that sense, right? So, I mean, it, it, the politics of how how each one of those investigations has an effect are are quite complex and unique to to each one of those investigations. It's a little bit hard to generalize, I think, and to give you an answer about how do we do it usually. But um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 there is there is something I think of of what I'm trying to propose with this idea of a secondary witness is that you could you could enforce somehow the fact that that um, that we are present and I'll be kind of even mediated in a mediated way, but we are witnessing those things through through online viewing, through TV, etc., etc., we are present in one way or another and we are affected. And so recognizing that already um, brings in a certain type of proximity um, and, and a certain type of challenge of, of having to take a position, right? I mean, I think, I think there's more to unpack and to work on. I haven't fully worked on this idea of, of uh, secondary witnessing as a sort of as a proposition of a, of a political practice, but this is where I'm heading, let's see. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I have a um, um, probably very uh, primitive and elite question. Um, I mean, when, when Jan says that um, what you present here makes his own work feel less significant, I guess it's, it has to do with that the piece you presented here was about intervening in, in real politics and, and making a difference there. Um, but, but would it make a difference if you presented this project in the context of, I don't know, in, in a law school uh, or here, which is a static seminar? So, so my question is simply, um, mm -hmm. could, you, could you comment on the aesthetic dimension in this? What, what, what does that consist of in, in contrast to I mean, making a difference in relation to politics and, and law. Mm. I I do think that I think that the, the particular <coughs> political challenges of these cases are absolutely tied to the aesthetic challenges. 
right? Because in each one of those cases, we are asked to work with very particular media artifacts that have their own challenges like pixelated footage or partial footage or silent footage, um, no metadata, etc., etc., that they have their own uh, conditions. And I think the way that, that, um, that those conditions are somehow determining the political um, scene is, uh, is for me really interesting. Now, to, to, to think about um, the way that those, um, the way that, that aesthetics doesn't necessarily need to be kind of um, outlined as a, at least for me, as a discipline that only kind of looks at, um, at a certain type of materials, but to expand that and to think about the way that, um, that aesthetics perhaps uh, is able to, to understand the way that the inscription of information happens, right? Like this, the way that events are sensed. I mean, if you think about like the root of the word aesthetics, right? Like all about sensing. And then, then for me, it opens up beyond, to, it opens up kind of like a media thinking that is beyond um, the particularities of, um, of this case or that case or any other case and, and could be expanded in an understanding of, of, um, of the way that, that essentially the story, particular political stories are ingrained through media objects and also ingrain us. So the, the challenge that I was trying to formulate in this kind of final part of, of the presentation was to say, um, okay, the, there is a, a strict distinction between the, the media object and the, the subject that understands and, and reads media. But what if we scramble that, right? What if we think about the body as well as both a, a, a sensor, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an apparatus that senses, and as well as one as a surface of inscription, as one that captures information and stores it in a certain way, right? And what if we were to borrow some of the language of aesthetics and, and some of the, the you know, the, the very rich history and, and, and theory of, of um, of looking at uh, at media objects and try to to kind of use it in order to understand the way that that this information uh, could be inscribed within a body. I don't know if this answers your question at all, but this is where I'm heading, kind of. I actually have the, the exact same question myself uh, for myself on this too, but, but I would also say that that uh, or ask if some of the things that. Uh, distinguishes what you do from, for instance, uh, investigative journalism. You might say that in, an investigative journalist believes firmly in the media through which he communicates, uh, namely uh, language. So, so the medium in which you present your evidence is not sort of, a, it's a kind of transparent, whereas uh, in what you present, uh, you might say that it's also a questioning of the very media, or medium through which you communicate uh, the evidence and how to build that when you use yeah. your operative models and sort of trying to synchronize pieces of evidence. It's, yeah. it's also a way of, sort of actually developing a kind of language or medium through which to, to communicate your own. Yeah, and, and I, I don't think that it is, um, I mean, we're very much implicated in this politics, right? Like it's, it's not that we're only commenting on the, the way that the grainy footage appears and leave it at that. We then, you know, move on to produce our own videos and our own images and our own, you know, like also like actively working on this, which means that we are responsible for the, the media artifacts also that we produce. But, but um, it's also kind of to recognize the power of that and to try to, I guess, I guess it's in each case it's trying to figure out um, multiple ways that that the relationship between um, an event, uh, the information that, that that the speciality and and the and the kind of um, the different information that I, that comes out of an event is is somehow captured, codified, translated, um, um, kind of. Um, 
transferred, um, copied, etc., and uh, and has this kind of political life. But um, yeah. I also have a kind of favor and walking on the list. And yeah. uh, you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think it's very useful to hear about these different forms of witnessing, and I also take the point about situated knowledge, etc. But I have a question about forum, mm -hmm. because forensics is also about addressing a forum. I, maybe a little bit in line with uh, Jakob, because I wondered if. So, if you could say a little more about your interdisciplinary team, I mean, mm -hmm. how, uh, what kind of people are you, and how do you work with rhetoric in relation to different kinds of fora? Because as I as I hear you, you are, you have you are also addressing a sort of a wider audience. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, Julia Araki or Kuli Araki, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, they also work with this kind of cosmopolitan audience or like, you know, uh, as what you would say, ironic intellectuals uh, that are sort of an international audience, etc. So are you working strategically with, so, and also there might be political or different kinds of political audiences, etc. Are you working strategically with the rhetoric uh, in terms of, you know, how to present a crime. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, just on the first part, the the team is now twenty five people, um, and another six or seven in Berlin. So quite a big team, but uh, always changing because people come in and out for particular investigations. Mm -hmm. They are um, they come from a variety of backgrounds: architects, artists, filmmakers, um, software designers, uh, engineers. Um, mm -hmm. journalists, a um, couple of legal scholars, um, what else? They literary come from scholars? Hmm? Literary scholars? Legal, legal scholars. <laughs> no literary scholars. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> we have Thomas, Thomas <laughs> Keenan. <laughs> well, Thomas Keenan, yeah, of course, of course. He's but, a literary but he, scholar. Yeah. Come on. Is he? <laughs> Is that, <laughs> yeah, I, may, may, I don't know if this is how he identifies, but um, I, anyway, so yeah, uh, scholars for sure, no, across the, the, the spectrum. So yes, we, we do have, so, so the whole point of working inter interdisciplinarily is that each person brings in a different type of intelligence, right? And, and so it's not it's not about producing an investigation from i mean a, a strict expert witness would really very clearly um, identify with a particular discipline and um, at a particular institution presented as such so we're kind of uh, in between those and in that sense i think to be honest i don't know how else we could do it because some of those investigations require very different types of of um, analysis so you know, when we're working on, for example, um, herbicide, and it, it, uh, we're working on the dispersal of of, um, of different toxins in the air, you cannot do it without the fluid dynamics uh, expert, right? So it comes from very particular fields. People come in, contribute something, um, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it does. It does. Much of the work is kind of coordinating all of those different efforts and weaving them together into something that could uh, act politically. In terms of rhetoric and in terms of, of the language used, I think you know it is something that again uh, comes up in practice very often in each one of the investigations. There are different challenges of how to articulate certain things. The other thing I want to say is that it's not just about including people from multiple disciplines, but it's also working with people who are from these particular places. So when you know when we're when uh, when Peter you were asking about this investigation, this context versus another context, it's um, immensely important to be able to have someone who has an understanding of that scene. I mean, in this case, I happen to be Greek, and um, and I do understand a little bit of, of that. But we also had. Um, Stefanos who, who lives in Greece uh, and um, and has a kind of a, an activist life there as well. In each context, we would work either with people who are from there or from an organi with organizations that are from there that have a different type of understanding of, of what we're working with. And I think this is also a type of expertise that both determines the the way that we formulate our research questions 
and the sort of language that we use to, mm -hmm. to address it, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, and it comes with its own challenges, right? Like in, in, when we work in Palestine, uh, it's very difficult to choose the, the right words that are both going to be serving um, the, the, the people who, who, work, who live under occupation and their activist fights, and at the same time, be able to present evidence in, in forums that require a very neutral, clean, uh, apolitical sort of language, right? I mean, and, and things that could be considered benign, like calling the, the Israeli occupation an occupation, is not, right? So, so it's very, it, it definitely is something that comes up again and again and again. I think in the context of, of court cases, it's one of the, of the times where we, we rehearse this even more because we, it's, it's, it's one of the, the forums that requires you to squeeze into format rather than allows you to expand and yeah. reflect and be able to, you know, in exhibitions we could use whatever, whatever language we want. We feel like much more, I mean, not all exhibitions, there's also censorship, but, you know, in, in most places we, we feel like we are able to to bring in also moments of reflection or moments of, of doubt, whereas in a in a court case we would never say we could say we could say that this is how certain we are, but we could we could never say that truth is an is a is a relative thing and there's multiple versions, you know. So there's a very there's a very strange way that we have to like we are allowed to do some of that work and some 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 of that thinking work in spaces like this, right? Or where we could reflect openly, and some other times we have to defend it as you know, as as this is the most solid of facts, mm -hmm. and so it is in that sense a bit of a schizophrenic uh, mm -hmm. uh, practice. But um, but again, it's not to say that you have to compromise and say that I know everything. It is more to say that there are some things that are knowable and that need to be established as facts and. Actually, this relativization is also not helping um, accountability efforts when we say that, well, it's too complicated and, and who knows what happened and there's multiple, you know, this sort of Trump rhetoric of like there's, there's two, two sides to each story. You know, at some point you have to insist and say there's multiple things that we can consider, but there are some things that are knowable and there are some things that are clear. And we, that, that's usually how we, we work with those. But the question of rhetoric is interesting. It, it, it's very much in practice, I think, for us, in practice, the way that we formulate the scripts and the way that we, that we write up the presentations and the sort of, yeah, I mean, I mean just to words like possible, probable are mm -hmm. things that we've learned from, from kind of the legal practice, right? Like this is the language of legality. Um, that it is important in some way to, to, in the same way that I was describing the margins of error, it is important to qualify what you know and how, how certain you are, you are mm -hmm. for the things that you know. This is, this is also part of the reason why people should believe you, because you've considered that you might be mistaken, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, the notion of, of secondary witnessing is uh, extremely intriguing and, and interesting, uh, and as a political practice, it might, might also be construed as secondary wis witnessing as an aesthetic practice. Uh, in, in some sense, I guess, we are always already secondary witnesses when we engage into aesthetic relationality, and that's extremely interesting. I guess my question was was actually very much uh, something connected to what you already answered to Karl Magrede. It was uh, kind of the the um, the uh, um, relationship between the right to wit witness as a secondary witness, which mm -hmm. you sort of argued in favor of, and, and then on the other hand, the, the, the content of what is stated by the by the witness, because uh, in, in your case, which you documented very carefully, I mean, you were actually proving the inconsistency of the official version of, 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 of these events, and you were actually overruling an already existing authority and then establishing an authority by actually sort of 
proving what 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 really happened. So so you made it right in a referential sense, and and you did that as a secondary witness. But uh, but in the end, you actually uh, claimed rightfully <laughs> authority for your version. But but you actually, uh, uh, I would have liked you to to kind of. Um, um, Give us a little bit about more about your reflections on this, but you already did partly. But then I would then I would uh, ask my secondary question because that was actually also what I would have liked to. Uh, could you say a few words about what you expect to be? Since you've tried it before as well, since you ex what you expect it to be the the impact or the effect of exhibiting uh, your work at uh, Louisiana, exactly at Louisiana as an art museum, as a, a, a very high privileged uh, art museum of, 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 of Northern Europe. What, uh, what does that, and that's connected to Jakob's question of course, what, what, what does that add, or, or, or the opposite, to, to, to your work? And, and feel free not to, to answer the first part of it, because you probably did, but the uh, floor is yours, okay? No, I mean, I think I think it's a it's a it's a good question, and it's I'm very much in the process of uh, making the exhibition with the curators now, but um, it's it's difficult also to take a step back and, and imagine what what it does. But you know, let's say that we we took this opportunity to to reflect. I mean, it, it wasn't one of the cases where we're kind of inserting a, an investigation into local politics, but. Um, but we took the opportunity to reflect on the role of witnessing. So part of this work came also from that. Uh, and, um, and also to, to think about the role of witnesses and, and different types of witnesses within our practice. And so I think what happens in those, invest in those uh, opportunities of an exhibition is that it intensifies kind of um, conceptual thinking that will then uh, feed back into work in, in, in kind of political work in ways that uh, is sometimes like non-linear, right? So it's not very clear to say that okay, at this moment, you know, this concept was derived here, and then and then came back and 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 changed the way that we thought about an investigation. But I do find very often that this kind of this moment of of almost like a, a pause and a reflection and an understanding of of the ways that we could be presenting those materials gives us different ideas when there are new materials coming at us and all the ways that we could explore them differently. I mean, in this, uh, in, in the exhibition, there, w there is one piece that uh, we're working on. Um, I mean, it's an old piece, but we're kind of exhibiting it again, a slightly different way um, of the, the killing of Khalid Yosgo by the NSU, so the, the German neo-Nazi attacks. And, there in this piece, because we're talking about reenactments and often kind of countering official uh, claims, um, we're also talking about it as a, I think Egal mentions it as as a bad witnesses this section because it's all about uh, thinking about the the narratives of the police that are not to be trust worthy. And there's another really nice term. Um, I think coming from literary studies, actually, the unreliable uh, narrator, I think, right? So this idea that you're reading through a document, but you're not to, to be trusting the person who narrates it, which creates this sort of alienation and, and, and the sense of, um, like, it stops you from, from identifying with, with uh, the protagonist. That, and I think it's really interesting to think about the, about the, the unreliable narrator as a category in, in their own right, because it, it becomes a way of, um, of thinking of the way that something is composed and analyzing rhetoric as well, analyzing the narrative that is being presented. And what we would do in, in those cases that take bit by bit the, their testimony, in that sense maybe it is a literary analysis, mm -hmm. right? Take bit by bit what they claim and try to deconstruct it. And to deconstruct it with different materials, often visual, spatial, etc., etc. But um, but so I think there, there is that part of, of um, I guess, reflecting uh, through this process and, and thinking about different types of witnessing and how could we recognize um, the, the expertise of, of the different types of witnesses. And then, of course, there is a part where um, 
the part that perhaps we cannot control, but it's also what happens when you place work like that in a particular context. Um, and here, you know, this is the, the, I'm not sure what would happen, but usually what's interesting is that when there are big exhibitions like that that, that come into a new context, usually there's a bunch of other practices that come in and learn from it and perhaps um, replicate some of those methods or, or um, experiment with new ones. And I think that's that's really exciting, right? Because then we're talking about the way that that the investigative practice expands not only as, you know, it's not just it would bring us more work as an office, because I think we have enough, you know, there's enough crime, there's enough uh, human rights abuses in the world to keep us busy, but, but and we can only grow so far, but the idea that you expand the field of this practice and there's other people who might take up some of those techniques and, they, and do it in their own way, so... One of the things that we were insisting on uh, in this exhibition is to try to address, to at least show investigations that are somehow related to the Danish context and somehow related to the Danish politics, which, again, I don't understand very well myself, but, uh, but um, also, you know, to, to, for example, put in, on the table questions of, uh, of the politics of migration that, again, we've done work in, in, in Greece and in the central Mediterranean, uh, Denmark occupies a very different position within um, Europe and the question of, of the border of Europe. You know, Greece is literally the border. It's the thickness of the country is the thickness of the border of Europe. You know, uh, here you are uh, much further away, but uh, it's not that, that there is no implication as well. I remember also the time where Denmark was, you know, buying fences um, uh, for the Greek borders, etc., etc. So we are insisting in, in putting some some thematics at least, though we have not worked in this context, at least some thematics that people would be able to reflect upon and perhaps, you know, continue in their own ways. And uh, and I think it's it's then a question of like what sort of conversations will, will come out of it. And I hope it's not a sort of conversation where like, okay, this is just Greece and they're just all corrupt and here we're fine. But it's a bit more nuanced and complicated than that. We'll take, uh, we are running out of time, uh, but we will take a question from you and then the last one from you afterwards. Yes, I'll try to do it fast, and maybe you already uh, uh, answered a bit or touched upon it when answering some previous questions. But um, yeah, uh, as you as you mentioned, um, there are of course cases in which it's crucial to have knowledge from a lot of different fields in order to do a to do justice to the investigation. And in terms of that, I'm just wondering a lot about how forensic uh, architecture, uh, and there's probably no such thing as, an, as a constant or ideal form, but, but how, how does this uh, root uh, position uh, itself exactly as yeah, an, an, an organization or whatever to call it that uh, sometimes I imagine benefits from being outside of established institutions and being able to draw upon all these different expert uh, knowledges from different fields, but probably at other times are or is limited in terms of maybe not having access to as much knowledge or data or um, whatever you need in your investigations as those who are officially part of the corrupted police force or whatever. <laughs> but 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 I guess then my question is. Is it mm, mm, mainly a, like purely a question of a, a context-based and genealogical, um, yeah, yeah, work uh, or method uh, that you need to use uh, according to the specific case and institution and country you are operating in, or are there also something as uh, more uh, structural or general? Um, Ideals, let's say that uh, forensic architecture um, also uh, is trying to make it clear to some of these more established institutions, let's say education, law education, that some of the methods you are using should be implemented and, and used more widely out in um, some of these bigger yeah, institutions. Mm. Um, I mean, I guess I'm not sure what our position would be if, if those in, of like the institution of 
law or uh, education need, needs to be doing this sort of methods. I know that they are slowly, you know, it, uh, forensic architecture is taught in the university kind of uh, basis, uh, both in Goldsmiths and elsewhere. Um, there are other institutions, like for example, the New York Times have, have kind of um, established the official investigations. A department that was very much kind of in conversation with us that started uh, from that paradigm and they're doing their own work from that. I think what we care mostly about is that um, that this work is done also by uh, different uh, civil society activist groups that they are enabled to do that. Although there is obviously a threshold, there, you know, it is quite technological work and it does require s skilled people to be able to, to do this sort of work. It's not, it still is very much accessible in the sense that if you know how to do 3D modeling or video editing, it's very easy to do that sort of investigation, right? Like it's, it's very easy to also access and understand how something is done because most of our work is also partly a tutorial on how to make it yourself as well. So in that respect, I think we are very much invested in, in kind of allowing others to be able to do similar work especially in the occasions where we are not able to because we have limited capacity, but most important because I think it's, it's important that we're not the only ones and it's not just institutions that are, are, that are able to do this, that there are local activist groups who have the means necessary in order to, to look back. And so in that respect, perhaps the message towards those, um, I mean, I guess you said, like, what is the position in terms of, yes, we always have less material available than what the police would have, for example, we have less access. You know, I once spent like a year investigating the bombing of of, um, of the town in in Gaza um, and locating every strike, and I and I could feel very close to the person who ordered those strikes. Like if I was thinking, if only they would tell me where they dropped the bombs, I wouldn't have to spend a year finding them. You know, so in a way, obviously, the condition is that you're starting from a place where you know much less than the person that you are, or the, the institution, or, the, or the, the kind of organization that you are investigating. But the whole point is that of access. The whole point is that there should be more, uh, more kind of a, a skilled capacity to look back, and also to say that, that um, you know, it's not that we will investigate every time that a police force or military does something wrong, but it is to say that it is possible to investigate. And so knowing that it is possible for someone to investigate already kind of conditions what, uh, what happens, right? So one final question, and we'll ask you to No, I was thinking like, how do you work with an, or consider like um, questions of whether court court rooms actually are places that carries out justice? So, so sorry, say like, that again. Like I would question like from my own. I've been sitting witness also in different court cases and uh, court making, and I experienced like a, a big leg or inability to understand the uh, structure of racism, for instance. Um, and I didn't find that this is a place where justice actually happens, or I don't believe that those people who sit in those positions carries out a, a justice. And yeah, I'm just considering within your work how, mm -hmm. you, how you work with this, or uh, think mm -hmm. with this, as, yeah. as you do work with the courtroom, but yeah. yeah, and somehow go along with maybe the idea of this as a justice-serving institution. Yeah, I, I'm but, just curious about your, your reflections. Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the main uh, like aftertaste that was left after I presented uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, for, for Zach's case. It, it was really like, seriously, this is how we deliver justice? I mean, really, that, that's the process that we've chosen as a people, you know, as universally to to arbitrate uh, in, in moments like that, it feels so insufficient actually and so, you know, so problematic in, in many ways. But I think, I think what, what is important to consider also, and in, in that case, you know, I was just joking with, uh, with Jakob that if we did the, the lecture last year, it would have, I wouldn't have presented for the Zach case and I would have only presented today like the case for Golden Dawn, which 
finished in this kind of big triumph because finally, you know, Goldon no longer exists. And so in that way, it would have been like a lot more like happy for everyone and energetic that, you know, something happened, we did win. And so I think it's important to consider all of those forms as always problematic, always compromised, like none of them are perfect. Also exhibition space are not perfect, the media are not perfect, there's no perfect place to, to be addressing this, um, but as very important kind of battlegrounds, and I think this is also how, for example, the family of, of the victims also have a similar um, position where, you know, they, they're in a very strange position because they want to believe that this is the way that some justice will be served. And at the same time, they're confronted with the, the difficulty of, of, you know, the, the imperfection of it. In, in the case of, of uh, Zach, for example, there was no projector in the, in the courtroom. And uh, the family had to insist that there's a projector because the, the whole incident was recorded. And they said, no, it's okay, we can bring a laptop and show it around. And at some point, the family said, well, pay for the projector. You have to, have, you have to show this, right? So... When, when there's an institution that doesn't take seriously something like that, when the, the case itself, the importance of the case is all recorded, in, it's all kind of on public view, but the court itself doesn't make the smallest step in order to, to be able to view it. I mean, these are, th these are kind of hurdles that's, that we're dealing with day to day, but I don't, for me, it's not a question of like either rejecting the court or fully believing in it. It's, it's more understanding that it is another complex place where there's some political fight that is very important. And, but, you, but we also have to recognize, you know, we can expect little from it sometimes, you know. In, in the, the case of Goldon was truly exceptional because it was so egregious and was so, there's so much evidence. It would have been a huge uh, scandal if they didn't. <laughs> uh, the criminal organization, but others are much more borderline, you know, and there's moments where, for example, in, in Palestine, we very often don't engage with the Israeli court because there's no point. They, if they don't recognize Palestinians as, as people who have human rights, there's no point. So, anyway, sorry, that was not a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll stop here. Thanks a lot for your questions and thanks a lot for your presentation and for presenting your body and yours uh, in this room. So thanks. And you're all welcome to join us in the lunch room on the fourth floor of the building over there. There's an elevator. <laughs>